uh, uh, Professor Fadi Sharbel today. Uh, we, uh, we were on hold for a microsurgical uh, resurgence webinar series for a while. And, and uh, we are reopening the sessions again. And Dr. Professor Sharbel doesn't need introduction. Uh, I, I was thinking how I can describe him. Uh, uh, he's, first of all, he's one of my shockings. I have, since 1994, I came to United States. I have been following him. I watch his live surgeries and uh, I learn a lot from him. I still learn a lot from him. And he's a, he's a very careful thinker and he's innovator uh, and clean, outstanding, I don't know how to describe neuro, micro neurosurgeon. And, and then uh, he has ability to describe and, and, and uh, 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 understand the things in very clear manner. Uh, uh, and, and most importantly, he's a true gentleman. Uh, a man of the world. Uh, so uh, he innovated many things. He has millions of publications. Besides that, uh, a true micro neurosurgeon, and we invite here the true, true micro neurosurgeons. Uh, uh, Dr. Sharbel, uh, I don't want to take more of your time, and please take the stage, and time is yours. We have no limit. Talk as long as you need to. We'll have uh, questions and answers at the end. Thank you again. Thank you for joining. I'll start my sharing here. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, it's a real it's a real treat to be here with you, uh, Professor Baskaya and Kutulai, and I saw Professor Ture uh, there. Uh, uh, all people that I admire and they're uh, my friends, and uh, what a nice group to be together. Uh, so thank you uh, for for putting this together because uh, <clears throat> we learn from each other. Uh, I learn from the things you do. I certainly uh, uh, have watched your surgery also, all the beautiful work you're doing, uh, putting them out there for people to freely review. Uh, Mustafa, that's an enormous amount of effort. I know you have uh, your right hand uh, uh, Associate Gutule and and look at Professor Ture. I mean, he's he's joining us right now. He could do something else, uh, but we, we we just uh, you know we love to learn. I mean, that's really what floats our boat, and uh, so it's a real treat. So I'll try to do justice to your effort uh, with this talk, and uh, let me share my screen. By the way, uh, I see you have Professor Yasher Gill's uh, picture back there. Uh, no, no talk on bypass for microsurgery can happen without giving him credit and uh, acknowledging the legacy of Professor Yasser Gill, which is uh, you, which is Professor Ture, which is a lot of us. By the way, here, you see the Yasser Gill book right here. If you can see it uh, right there, right there. See uh, the biography of Yasser Gill sitting behind my desk. So <clears throat> share the screen. Here is the screen of my talk, The Art and the Logic for Bypass of Moya Moya. Uh, and this is the Baskaya Seminar, for those of you that are just logging in, Microsurgery Baskaya Seminar. Uh, my disclosures are related to the flow probe uh, that all of you know. This is something that I uh, uh, helped develop and uh, that's in use. So that's my disclosure. Uh, you know, I, I, there's so many pictures uh, on the internet about uh, Baskaya and uh, all the things he does. And, uh, and I picked this one. I could have picked many. Uh, I picked this one uh, because to me, uh, Mustafa, this uh, kind of sums it all. First of all, you see him intense. Uh, he's talking. He's, 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 what is he doing? He has a microscope in front of him. Uh, that must be a lab. 100% this is a lab, a lot of people around him, I can tell they're from different countries probably, an international uh, uh, group of students, and look how intense he is, uh, he's passionate, and, and I know that because I've seen him in real life, 
So to me, this is the epitome of uh, uh, Professor Baskaya. Uh, he loves to teach, he's passionate about what he does. He's constantly practicing the art of neurosurgery uh, like any, any virtuoso will do. And we all have to do, we continue to do that. And, uh, and that's him. So congratulations. Uh, I've watched your career. I've known you for many, many, many years. I've watched your career. Uh, courage. It takes courage to do what you did. Start all over again, like so many of us, many times. Continue to learn. Always act like we are students. Again, look at the people around this phone. Professor Turi is sitting in, in his house and, uh, and uh, gracing us with his presence. So uh, congratulations, Mustafa, for everything you've done and you will continue to do. These are the, the main highlights of the talk. Uh, I'll try to go through them and uh, we'll show some examples. So let's start with once more an acknowledgement of Professor Yeshergil. Uh, he is the idol of, uh, of uh, certainly everyone on this phone, on this video, performed the first bypass on October 30, uh, 67. Uh, and I, I find it very interesting that this is October 30 is my birthday. So uh, I don't know what that means, but <laughs> that's, that's, that's my birthday. So uh, maybe something like that happens in the cosmic level, man. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> sticking with history, this is our building. Uh, those of you that like the history. So this is the NYSEC Neuropsychiatric Institute. My office is somewhere here in, in this tower. Actually, no, in this tower. This is the South Tower. Uh, but it was built in 41 to look like the brain. It was the first like that in the world, looking like the brain. And it was founded by Oldberg, who was the last resident of Harvey Cushing. And then after Oldberg, there were successors, but namely my mentor, Dr. Ausman, with whom I worked for 17 years and uh, to whom I owe a tremendous amount. Uh, like all our mentors, we owe them who we are. Uh, that's the building now. Uh, it's part of the university. That's kind of the overview from the air of the university, the campus, the star here is our building. And a lot of engineering, a lot of work that we did together. So it was very helpful for me that's really one of the main reasons I went there uh, to continue to be there. It keeps us uh, engaged intellectually. Now, uh, Mustafa, this is a, an Ugur. This is our lab. So this is something we just finished, but because of COVID, we have not had any live invited guests. We've had many courses for our residents, uh, but we really hope to have you there. I know. Uh, you have a fantastic lab and everybody. This is a beautiful lab. The entire footprint of the building, we just finished it in September last year, call it the Surgical Innovation and Training Lab. Uh, it's a beautiful space <clears throat> uh, connected to the animal facility. We have a very nice animal facility like you have in Wisconsin, I know. So it has a main central area with 24 stations. So we can have, uh, if two per station, 48 people. We have two large operating rooms around it. We have classrooms. So our, we hold courses for our residents now and our fellows and uh, everybody likes it. It's really a very nice space. So we have to hopefully uh, have you here soon and we can organize something together. We can uh, talk about that. Look forward to that. Uh, so why perform a bypass? Really, this is a, this is a key question. And after thinking about it for, for a long time, you know, I was passionate, passionate always about the surgery. Uh, it, I came to this conclusion and I'm happy to say that this now has been accepted everywhere. So whatever you hear talks about bypass, people use this terminology, which makes sense. That's why people use it. Because we do bypass for one of two reasons. We either want to augment flow because there's a deficit to start with, ischemia, moya, moya, or we want to replace flow because we create the deficit. So really it's very simple. And once we start to think about it that way, why are we doing it? That we can construct the bypass more properly. So the second question is really a good one. 
what drives flow in vivo. And that is the key here, in vivo. And when we talk about this, often the thought, the, the mind goes to Poiseuille equation. And in Poiseuille equation, it's the diameter of the vessel or the size of the conduit that people think about, you know, that's going to drive the flow. That is true in Poiseuille's equation. But in, in bypass, in, in the conditions where we do bypass, what drives the flow is not the diameter of the vessel. You know, it could be shocking to a lot of people when I first say that, but, but that is the fact. And I'm going to show you why. And you, once you see this, you're going to really, if you didn't know that already, you're going to really appreciate that once you understand that the driver of flow in a bypass is the demand, then you will know how to construct your bypass properly, not use too big or too small a vessel, titrate it in the simplest way possible to the needed demand or the desired demand that you want in this bypass. So the most important determinant of flow in vivo is the demand, the pressure gradient from A to B. Okay. Uh, here's an example. So this person I did a bypass on because the carotid was occluded, STA, MCA, at three days angiogram, looks good, and 79 cc's of flow in the bypass as measured by the NOVA uh, QMRA. Now, at three months, we follow them. I do the three months flow measurement, and the flow is 37. It has decreased. What happened? Well, what happened is the uh, carotid, which was a dissection, reopened. And as a result, uh, the graft decreased and the flow in the bypass decreased. So here's an early example of this reciprocal relationship between demand and supply. That's what drives the flow in the bypass. And this is why we have to be very careful when we talk about uh, flow and, and, and somehow say, well, conduit name means flow. So a lot of times some people would say less now, but some people would still say, you know, high flow bypass and in their mind, it's a vein, a radial artery, low flow bypass is an STA occipital artery. That's not, that's not, that's not the proper way to think. This is not correct way of thinking because you can, the, the, the conduit size is one thing. A proper way to think in an accurate way of speaking would be a five millimeter conduit, a three millimeter conduit. And once you measure flow, you can say 50 cc's of flow. You can call it low flow. You can call it medium flow. You can call it high flow. It doesn't matter. You can say 150 cc's of flow. Because if you look at this matrix, this 2 pi 2, size of vessel of the conduit, high flow, low flow, you can have a large vessel with low flow. You can have small vessel with high flow. So it's really, really important. And that's that's why often, uh, you know, I bring this thing from The Last Emperor. And in and, 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 and that movie, when Peter O'Toole asked the emperor, we're talking about this, he tells him, it, talking about being a gentleman. And, and, and uh, Professor Baskaya was kind enough to say that. I think we all want to mean what we say. So it's really important from a scientific perspective, when we think about what we do, that we, that we mean our terms. What does it really mean when we say high flow? It doesn't mean large diameter. No, not at all. It means high flow. Large diameter means large diameter. And as I go through this talk, I think I'll show you some more examples. So how do we determine flow? Obviously, it's through quantitative flow measurement. And the tools that we have are the ultrasonic flow probe in the OR and the quantitative MRA with face contrast. The OR flow probe, everybody, you, 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 all of you know it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very good tool, not because I helped develop it, but because it's been validated by all the people around the world that use it. It's quantitative. That is the key. This is not velocity. And velocity does not necessarily correlate with flow. The diameter does not correlate with flow. We've said that. I'm going to say it again and again and show you example. Patency means patency, not flow. And 
the most difficult one to accept uh, because when I was beginning my training, Dr. Ausman would say to me, okay, check the pulse. And I feel the pulse. How's the pulse? Very good pulse. And uh, unfortunately, all of us that do this operation uh, actually be very, uh, I get scared now when a bypass has this very strong and bouncing pulse. In fact, you can put a clip on a bypass, it's still pulsating. And they actually will pulsate more because a pulse is this, uh, is a reflected waveform. So a bypass should, you know, flow smoothly with not a lot of pulse. If there's a lot of pulse, that could be a problem. So be aware of the bypass with a great pulse. Uh, that's the NOVA, the face contrast MRI, which another way to measure flow, and we can do it non-invasively with the MR. It's quantitative, it's a fantastic tool. I have uh, uh, no financial interest in this. Okay. We measure flow, what do we learn? The first thing is the cut flow. That's what I started with, cut flow. What is cut flow? Cut flow is the beginning of every uh, 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 surgery, of every bypass surgery with the native test. That's the first thing we do. We take the STA, we cut it, we measure flow. And that's very important because that will tell us what can this vessel provide? Because then when we measure the bypass flow, we can compare. Well, if a bypass can give this and I got that, you can start to think what happened? Why did that happen? So it's very, very important. It's also essential for bypass for aneurysm. Because if you're gonna use the STA to replace flow, which is a good idea because it's the simplest thing to do, you wanna make sure that this STA can replace the deficit. So you measure the deficit, you measure the cut flow. So that's the very first thing we do. And the important thing of this, of this paper, and we've, seen much more of that is the STA flow. Remember, high flow, low flow, it can range. I've had, in fact, STA flows of 250 cc's. And I've had STA flows that were in the single digit. So cut flow is the very, very, very first thing we should do before we get going. How much money do we have in the bank? So we know what to go from there. What can we do with it? So an example of how it's useful. So for example, here in this Moya case, start by measuring the cut flow. And it's a beautiful STA, but it was only nine, 10 cc's. And, and, and I'm so glad I measured it because once I measured it and I found it was so low, I immediately looked to see what the problem was and it was easy to find. I had coagulated the vein over it has caused the stricture once I cut the vein, the same vessel, same vessel flow went from 10 to 50. Okay, so you start to see that the driver of flow is not, is, is here is, is the demand. And you're going to see the, the, so there was a problem here. And the problem was there was a stricture in this vessel. And actually, you could say it was the diameter in this case. So it may not be the best example. But the point is that if I did not determine the problem, this vessel would probably would have thrombosed by the time I'm ready to do the anastomosis. So the index, once you measure the cut flow and you measure the bypass flow, you compare the two. You simply compare the two. If a bypass can give 100 and you have a flow, uh, uh, the STA can give 100 and you have a flow of 100, that's a perfect bypass. You know everything went well. You don't have to think too much about it. But if not, let's say a bypass can give 50 and you have a by, uh, uh, STA can give 50 and you have a bypass flow of 20. Why is that? Start to think, well, wait a minute. Uh, maybe that's all that can do. Maybe there's some reason for it. And in fact, <clears throat> this index, if it's less than 50%, there is usually a, some problem. And we're gonna go over what the problems are. So this index is very important. We published it tw twice now. Once, but I don't know, more than 10, 15 years ago, and more recently, a year and a half ago, two years ago, with 300 cases, index of 50% is associated with high patency rate and less than 50% low patency rate and timing to occlusion. So it's very, very important thing to measure and to think about why is it that if a vessel can give X, and I'm not getting X, and then get you going. So bypasses fail, and why do they fail? 
here, here are the main reasons. So we classified bass in 2005. My goodness, that's a while back. And, and, and I've, I haven't changed this classification. It continues. The bypass fails for two main reasons. Either that the indication is not correct, so it wasn't needed, and that is historical, and it still happens though for aneurysms, or for some technical problem. And if you were to look at all the reasons, if you look at your experience, my experience, anybody's experience currently, if you select the patient properly, so type one, we put that aside, the most common reason for bypass failures is technical, is technical. And this is why it's so essential to train. You know, if, if, if you cannot do this surgery properly, it doesn't matter how good your brain is, it's not going to work. So the starting point, it has to be proper training. And there's so many models out there, some very sophisticated, some very simple. But, you know, this is my microscope at home here, it's sitting right there, you can see it. See that? That's, that's, that's what I do. So I don't have anything better to do. I play chess or I, you know, do something on the microscope. What do, what do I do it on? In fact, uh, Mustafa, I saw your thing. I, I completely agree with you. The training tool can be very simple, very simple. In fact, you know, uh, a, a flower, flower actually is very nice. I saw you do on the gauze. I agree. Very simple. You, know, you, you don't have to have a rat. I think it's such a waste. Just something simple, practice the mechanics. You get a little bit rusty. Do five, 10 minutes like you do push-ups. It's the same thing. So that's very important. And Professor Boskaya shows you that on the internet, how you do exercises like that, uh, which is really important. So the type one failure, type one failure is um, a failure where the bypass is not needed. Historically, that was a problem. That was the problem, I think, for bypass for ischemia. So I'm gonna show this case, which I saw a lot, but this is a supremely educational case. A patient that came in with occluded vertebral arteries, you see the flow going through the PCOM in his posterior circulation. And we did a bypass. I did it with my, with my mentor, Professor Ausman. We did not have a way back then to measure flow in these vessels with the MR. So we did not know if this patient needed it or not. All we had was the angiogram. And on this angiogram, you can see that uh, there's a big PCOM, but maybe the flow is not very good. We don't. So we did the bypass. And here is continuous recording through, during the surgery. This is a supremely educational case. Hopefully you pay attention. So in red is the donor. That's the superficial temporal artery, STA. And in blue is the reception. That's the superior cerebellar artery, SCA. So the bypass is to the posterior circulation, STA to SCA. So on the left, we are starting, we're measuring flow in the recipient continuously. This is continuous measurement. And then the donor in red. So here, here, if you can see my cursor, the flow in the STA is maybe three, four cc's. And that is because the STA is in the scalp. It's still in continuity. It's isolated, but it is not cut yet. And, and that is always like that. The flow in the STA in the scalp is, is usually single digits. I've never seen it more than 12, 13, never. Uh, and then take a look here at the flow in the same vessel, exact same vessel. It went from four to about 65, 66. Exact same vessels in less than a second or two. How, how could that be? Did we change the size of this vessel all of a sudden? No, it's the same exact vessel. What happened here? What happened is cut flow. I cut this vessel and I measure cut flow. So now that's how you find out how much this, flow get, this vessel can give you. So remember what we said, what is the most important determinant flow in vivo in bypass? It's not the diameter. It's the delta P, the pressure gradient. Pressure gradient, here the pressure was very high in the scalp, here the pressure went down to zero, it's air. And 
the flow in this vessel increased by 15, 17 times, more than an order of magnitude. You clamp it, and then we clamp the SCA, do the anastomosis, and we open everything. And look at that. Compare the SCA flow before and after the bypass. Was there any flow augmentation? Remember, two types of bypass. This is bypass for ischemia. So it's flow augmentation. Was there any flow augmentation? Of course not. You can see the flow did not change. So this patient did not need it. This was a type 1 problem. And the reason this patient did not need it, because remember how big, look at this PCOM. It's a huge PCOM. Patient already has a bypass. It already exists. And look at the index. Compare the bypass flow right here. The bypass flow is maybe 5 cc's. And the cut flow is 65 cc's. So it's an index of maybe 7 8%. So you see already you start to think. So if you don't know the cut flow, you look at this bypass, you say, I have, oh, eight cc's, five cc's, uh, maybe it's good. No, it's not good. This is type one problem. See? So it's important, measure cut flow, measure bypass flow, starts you thinking. I didn't get today to where I am without those measurements. Okay? That's for you. Now for flow replacement, this is where we see this problem in flow replacement bypass, because again, hopefully we select the patient properly for ischemia, but for flow replacement, this is a bypass that is done to replace a deficit. But if this deficit is not created, the bypass may not flow. So I'll show you only two examples. And here's the flow being measured in the MCA. And then we clamp the carotids and then we see what happens. And the flow in the MCA goes from 70 to 50. That means there's a deficit of 20. That's the deficit we want to replace. So we cut the STA and we see if that is enough to replace it. And sure, of course it is because there's 44 cc's of flow in the STA. Great, so we do the procedure. But then at the end, here's what we find. Baseline flow of 70, you clamp the carotid, that causes a deficit of 20 cc's. You check the STA to see if that's enough. Yes, the cut flow is 44, plenty. Do the bypass, and the flow in this bypass is only four. What is that? No demand yet. That's a type one problem. And when you clamp the carotid to trap it, now you have the deficit again and the bypass flows, you see? So you have to think about it because if you take too long, if you, so the message here, when do you trap? If you're confident, your bypass is good, you've replaced the deficit, you measured flow, trap quickly, trap right there at surgery. Because if you wait too long, this bypass of four cc's may occlude, may occlude and I've seen it when in the old days. I'll show you another example here, which is even better. This is a vein graft. Look at this, eight millimeter conduit. Is this high flow or low flow? It's eight millimeter conduit. It's eight, that's the proper accurate way of speaking. It's an eight millimeter conduit. I'm gonna put a vein graft from the carotid to the MCA for again, a large aneurysm and then trap. So, I do this, and then after I do this, it's done, I'm gonna measure flow in this graft. Look at this huge graft, how much is the flow? 24 cc's. Is it high flow or slow flow? It's 24 cc's, you can call it whatever you want. It's 24 cc's and a conduit of eight millimeters. So what does that mean? That means that you know that this vessel can carry more than 24 cc's. It's huge. It's as big as a carotid. Why? Well, because the carotid is still open. There's no delta P. There's no demand. Okay. And then what did I do? So I was wondering, should, do I have the courage to now take the carotid? Is this graft good? It's only 24 cc's. So before committing to taking this carotid right away, what did I do? I narrowed it a little bit. I narrowed it. So. It's right here. So I narrow it a little bit, 24 cc's. See, it's stopping right here. So I narrow it a little bit. 
I'm going to show you how I narrowed it. I narrowed it by putting an encircling clip on the on the carotid. See those encircling clips? It's a you know like the fenestrated clip. So I narrowed it, and the flow doubled. And then I sacrificed the carotid. And the, so remember, it was 24, went to 54, and then I trapped the aneurysm so completely, so it doubles again. And then by the time we measure flow in the MR, now it's 160. Same vessel went from 24 to 160. You see? So again, please remember that, that the driver of flow is, if you've done a good job, of course, is the pressure gradient, same vessel. So it was a good idea that I trapped the carotid right away. This was a patient had coiled and all this stuff and, you know, see all this mess here. Because if not, a vein graft with 24 cc's would probably would have occluded if I waited a day or two. Okay. So let's focus on Moya Moya, the main topic. In Moya Moya, the main problem is the recipient. It's the type 2C problem. Type 2C problem means this is a good bypass. The cut flow is 152. So again, please. I really don't want to hear high flow, low flow because it's the STA. It's like we're insulting the STA. The STA doesn't like that if we say low flow STA. You know, if it had feelings, you would hurt the feelings of the STA. We, we all know that STA can be anything. But here you have an STA of cut flow of 150 and a bypass flow of almost 150. Index of one, that's great. That's a carotid occlusion. But in Moya, cut flow here, 69 and the bypass is only 18. So the index is only 27%. And I started to think, well, what's the problem? When the moya moya, the problem is the territories do not communicate. So you can put a bypass classic angular branch, but it doesn't go anywhere. And that's why most people, when they do bypass for moya moya, what we do is we try to revascularize more than one territory. So this is kind of the evolution of bypass for Moya Moya disease for me, from the classic to, to the minimax, the single vessel double anastomosis or one vessel to anastomosis. I'm gonna show you how, how the flow measurements influence the art and the logic behind that over time. So I started like everybody, directly revascularize as many territories as needed, and so this would be an example here. We do the NOVA. You can see the flow in the left MCA. It's low. And then we do a yeah, diamox. It decreases even more. So there's a steel. So patient needs it. So if you do the first, so the cut flow is 40 cc's of the ST. Do the first bypass is 24 cc's. So it's index of a half. So we, this ST can give more. So we add the second barrel, the, the second called the so-called double barrel. That's another 20 cc's. And now the whole bypass is 44. So we have an index of one. So it makes sense. Double barrel makes sense. And you see here at patients, the trunk of the STA, uh, which is uh, 95 cc's, you see measuring it with the NOVA. And the two, the two limbs of the bypass, 95 cc's. So here's uh, a video of that. You can see right here, the double barrel, classic double barrel. Uh, we're opening the, uh, the dura here. So the cut flow in this double barrel is 76 cc's, 76 cc's. So we're gonna do two anastomosis. Uh, I'm not gonna show you the too much of the video, you all, I've seen videos and things like that. So, I mean, this is a, a, a simple STA, MCA anastomosis. And uh, I'll show you the result. So at the end, two barrels, measure flow in one, and here it is. So we have an index of one, 100 cc's, one branch is 65, another branch is 14. It's fantastic. Double barrel is a good thing. Okay. So here's another one, you can see double barrel, it's good. Uh, the flow, look at this one, anterior branch, posterior branch, 42. Total flow is great, double barrel, beautiful filling, a lot of filling. Trunk, 153 cc's, so SDA can provide a lot of flow. So this is good. 
What's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that, what I realize over time, because I measure flow and I continue to follow it by measuring flow with the MR, is that I found that a lot of these bypass flow actually involuted over time. Not a lot, but a number of them. And it's for mainly two reasons. One is we all know that it's a progressive disease. So, you know, the patient can continue to develop territories at risk. And if you use everything at once, what are you gonna do the next time? And the second thing I mentioned that is the bypass flow involute, multiple publications on that. So at over one year, the bypass patency goes from 96% to 74%. That is a fact. If you measure flow and you follow your patients, like Baskaya, myself, Ture, we, we stay there for a long time. I've been in the same place now for 30 years, follow my patients forever. And, and you find that out. So I don't want to hear that patency rate 99%, 100%, fine, good for you. But here's my data, okay? Over time, the bypasses involute. And, and, there's, and we have to be aware of that. So what did I start to do next? What I started to do next is, is a double barrel, but with insurance. So one branch, I would do a, a, a direct bypass. You know, so here's, here's, here's what I would do. I would do an end to side and side to side. So the flow first measuring the recipient is very low. You can see how low it is in the recipient. So patient needs it. And then here's the, 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 the cut flow. The only vessel that's cut is the frontal branch. It's 47. And the parietal branch is kept in continuity. And you see how the flow in it is very low. It's only one. Why? Remember, high resistance. So it's the same vessel. This one is 47. This one is one. You see that? So it's the delta P. So what I do, what I did for a while is this kind of, uh, it's still double barrel, but with insurance. And what I mean by that is uh, <clears throat> I do one anastomosis, which is a, uh, you know, end to side. Maybe I'll show a little bit of that. So it's end to side anastomosis. I do the toe first before the heel. Uh, why do I do that? Because that allows to uh, adjust the length of both, both limbs and the anastomosis. Um, and so, you know, I mean, this is a, a standard STA MCA bypass. Uh, superficial, nothing technically too uh, difficult about this. It's a pretty, pretty straightforward uh, uh, procedure. Um, there's no reason to show a lot of this. Okay, so we finish the we finish one limb of the bypass, and then uh, let me see here. We'll go to the the other one. I do side to side and leave it as an EDES. You see what I mean? So it's still double barrel, but this one is in continuity. So it's still connected as an EDES, just in case this one fails. So side, end to side, side to side, plus EDES. So now the frontal bypass is 35. Remember this vessel was only one, but now that you create a demand is 35. And uh, the other one, we're going to see in a minute, is 59. Look at that. So a lot of flow now, a lot of flow, and, and a fantastic index. So this is what I progressed to. And I like that. And I, and I like this. And I did it for a while. I think it's nice. But what's the problem with that? Uh, Here's another patient where I was planning to do the same thing. You see parietal branch, anterior branch was going to do same thing, direct with the frontal and side to side with an EDAS with the parietal. So I did that. I was about to do that. And oh, the video is not showing. Why is it not showing? You are seeing it? Yep. It's not it's good. It's, okay. It came back again. Yep. Okay. okay. So uh, double barrel. Like I wanted to do, I wanted to do a direct with the front and uh, side to side in continuity in the back. But you see what happened here, it was sectioned already. See that? So the choices are either do a double barrel end to, end to side with both of them or something else. 
So I did the direct bypass with the with the frontal branch. But before I start, let me show you. That's the cut flow, 115 cc's. So a lot of flow in this branch. So I did the traditional frontal branch, direct bypass, end to side, no problem. And when I finished that, it looked like right here, it looked like a beautiful bypass. There was a lot of flow in it. So I measured it and it was indeed 60, 70 cc's of flow in it. So I did not want to add more flow. I thought that might be too much. So what I did is I re-anastomosed the parietal branch to keep it as an EDES. Again, because I, I said, well, I'm not going to do a direct bypass and I want to sacrifice it. So I put it as an EDES and here it is. It's, it's completed as, in, as a, uh, it's in continuity again. So the parietal breast is back in continuity and I'm gonna measure flow. And this was really interesting here, what I found out. So here's the flow in the direct bypass. So the flow and in the indirect bypass in both of them. So the flow in the direct bypass is 71 cc's. Remember the cut flow was a hundred. In the EDES, Look at that, it's actually going negative. So it's going from the scalp back into the brain. And look at the ICG. Direct bypass. And look at the indirect bypass. It's going from the scalp back into the brain. See that? So I, it's, it's fascinating all the things that, that, that we can do. So I'm gonna, so here's that post-op angiogram. So you see the frontal branch direct bypass. You see the parietal branch uh, re-anastomos and EDES. So I started to think to myself, well, and here's the, uh, the NOVA flow. You see, that's the direct 122 cc. So see, over time, the flow increases. So now it's 122. It was 70 at surgery. And in the parietal branch, which is kept as an EDES, it's 19 cc's. So it got me thinking that maybe I should use less vessels and not do this big of a surgery. And this is where I started to do the single vessel double anastomosis. And that eventually led to the one V, uh, one vessel to anastomosis or what some people call the minimax. So here's a patient that has bilateral carotid occlusion. He has steel, you see his right MCA flow doesn't increase, the ACA has steel, the PCA not much increase. So he has a beautiful STA. Look at this big, big frontal branch. The parietal branch is far away. So if I wanna do the classic incision where I go like this, take the parietal branch, loop to the front, that's a massive craniotomy. And I thought maybe I can do a single vessel double anastomosis. So the cut flow, 117, Recipient flow, very low, three, he needs it. So I start with a side to side, measure flow, it's 67. So we have 67% index. And then I do an end to side with the, with, the, with the distal end and the measure flow here, it's 40. So it's 60 plus 40, about 110. Single vessel, double anastomosis, side to side, and end to side. And I like that. So this was now many years ago. This is uh, 2013. I started doing that. And you see side to side, end to side, total flow 140. Uh, and this then to me achieves all the things that we want to achieve. It's a direct bypass. It avoids the idea that it involutes, it leaves another vessel for salvage because the disease is progressive. It optimizes for index of one and so forth. So let's see, what is this case here? Okay, that's actual the surgery that I showed you the, in the beginning. That's the STA being protected. So we cut the dura, protecting the middle meningeal artery. Make sure we do not disrupt collaterals. And you can see we pick one side on one side of the fissure and another side on the other side of the fissure. You see the sylvian fissure there. 
Remember, this is the case where the cut flow was low, and then I realized that the vein was compromised, uh, that the vein was compromising the artery, so I immediately realized that and uh, cut that vein, which averted the problem. If I didn't measure it right now, probably would have thrombosed, and now the cut flow became 50, which is good. And then I go ahead and I'm going to do the uh, the side to side anastomosis, measuring flow in the recipient. Actually, it wasn't bad here. Recipient wasn't bad. So side to side anastomosis first. Just going to advance it a little here. Technique is well known. So side to side, and after that, I'm going to do a an end to side anastomosis, and you can see now we have an index index of one. So this bypass is only 15 to 20, but the the trunk is over 50, so end to side and side to side, single vessel, double anastomosis. And that's, that's the surgery. So that's the preferred surgery that I do right now for these types of problem. And uh, we published it in 15 and showed it multiple meetings. There's videos on the internet if you wanna see them, of the full surgery. Uh, published again a series in 19, and it achieves all the goals. So it's a progressive disease, bypass involutes. We want to directly revascularize to correct the type T3 problems. We want to revascularize as many territories as needed. We want to optimize for the donor flow. We want to strive for an index of one. If an STA can give 50 cc's, we want to get all those 50 cc's out of this ST. We use as few vessels as possible to minimize surgical trauma, to leave salvage options. We want to avoid disrupting collaterals. And for ischemia, for moya, there's no need to exceed more than 80 to 100 cc's. We do not, there's no reason to do that. In fact, it would be dangerous. So here's again another what it looks like, and to side to side and end to side. They grow over time. Now, sometimes I'm going to show you a little modification. I was doing this case with my fellow, and this was the cranny, and I wanted to do it. But then I expanded the cranny, and I want you, I want you to just see this because it's, the dynamics are so interesting. So here's that surgery. You see that branch, the parietal, and that's a little bit of the frontal branch. So I extended the cranny a little bit. And again, two branches on either side of the fissure, but I ended up doing just one, one anastomosis here. And what I want to show you that's interesting is that, is that once I finished and I did this anastomosis, I want to show you this. Uh, the cut flow is, is one, but look, there's the parietal branch. This is the frontal branch. So this is an EDAS, and this is a direct bypass. Look at the ICG, direct bypass. Look at the indirect bypass. It's flowing, but it's back and forth. You see that? Why? Because this is high resistance. I'll show it one more time. Directly into the brain, integrate, and this is back and forth with the EDES. And what's beautiful is once you measure that flow actually in the MR afterwards, see that's the STA trunk and it goes directly into the brain, and that's the EDAS. First of all, what you see is look at the EDAS now. It's smaller, and the direct is bigger. So in the trunk, you see the flow here. It's integrate. See, it's pulsating integrate. It's 129 cc's. In the direct bypass, it's 97, and it's also integrate directly towards the brain. But in the EDAS, look at it, it's oscillating around the zero line. It goes from positive to negative. You see it, and it's only six cc's. So it's the same mother, 
that gives two twin children. They should be exactly the same. Why does this one have 60 cc's? What was it, 60? No, 97 cc's. And this one has only six cc's. Why? Exact genetic material, it's the same vessel. Different delta P. One is still going to the scalp, one is going to the brain. One has high resistance, one has low resistance. So, and of course, Jacques uh, published his series using the same technique. He had, of course, in Jacques fashion to call it something different, but it's the same thing, 1D, 2R. But uh, it demonstrated exactly the same thing, which is that the index increased by about 50% if you add the second anastomosis, the end to side anastomosis. So in summary, SVTA, one vessel to anastomosis or minimax, you can call it whatever you want, but the principle are use as few vessels as possible to minimize trauma and preserve options for later, side to side, preserve the dural collaterals. You see here the, the middle meningeal is retracted so you can stitch underneath it rather than cutting it. If you have a vein, same thing, you can put a stitch on it and retract it. It's a beautiful surgery. So we went from double bypass to single vessel, double anastomosis. And the idea is that what we're doing is a means to an end. There's still a lot of uncertainty in this. I don't think we even know what the really perfect surgery is for this disease. But what we do know is we're trying to, we're trying to improve the hemodynamics and we want to hopefully improve outcomes. Still a lot of uncertainties, but technique is essential and cognition comes from data. We grow cognitively from examining our results and the data uh, of our results. So uh, hopefully this was useful to you.